All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, River Song. It's good to see you today. It's nice to have some uh, some good weather out there finally. And uh, I didn't even wear a coat in here today. It was super cool. So it's, uh, we got a great service uh, planned for today. Uh, really good worship. And uh, we're going to worship the word of the day in worship is that we were not called to worship or live with the spirit of timidity, but one of strength and power. And so we're going to worship that way this morning. And uh, we've got communion this morning, uh, so that's great. If you did not get um, communion things on the way in, just uh, go back to the back there or raise your hand and Darren will bring it out to you. Uh, little cups with the wafer built into it, so we can do that here shortly. And as an added bonus... We're going to get two sermons today, one from Dave Dingman and one from Pastor Jim. So, <laughs> super cool, uh, super cool uh, that this is happening. So, um, anyway, well, let's go ahead and uh, stand with us this morning and let's worship the Lord together.
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. No, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
close to us, Lord. We just want communion. We're so thankful you're our friend, you're our savior, you're everything.
We're going to celebrate our communion time right now. So uh, if you didn't get a uh, cup when you first came in, Darren can take care of that right there in the back. And these are the tricky little rascals that are sometimes a little bit difficult to use. I don't want that to be a distraction. Let me just explain a little bit, then we can get started. If you take that little tab and kind of give it a little bend, that very top layer of foil will come off and you can get to the, the little wafer. And then you peel again, you get to the juice. If you don't peel it right the first time, you get the juice first. So it's all right. If you do it backwards, it still counts. Some versions, Jesus shared the bread first. Others, it was the cup first. So it doesn't matter. But uh, isn't that something? That song talks about here's where the dead things come back to living. And that's really what Jesus did for us. You know, Jesus didn't come just to make good people better. He didn't come to just rehabilitate us. He came to make dead people alive. And, uh, and so that's, that's what this is about. We come to the Lord with nothing. And we just say, Lord, you are the Lord of me. You're my boss. I want to serve you. I want my life to be your life. I want what you are to be reflected in me and manifest in me and through me. And so uh, we do that with communion. The, the, the piece of bread is Jesus' body that was beaten and he suffered in that thing. They whipped him and hit him and a crown of thorns and hit him on the on the whipping post to heal our bodies, to mend our relationships, and even, I believe, to put the church back together as it should be. And then his blood that was shed is for the sending away of our sins, the remitting of our sins, to send them so far away they can't even be remembered. And so he said, do this often, and when you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So the whole plan of this is, the reason we do this every month, is just to refresh our memory about how important Jesus' sacrifice was for us. We don't just serve a religion of do's and don'ts and relationships with people and an organization, but it's our relationship with God that is uh, sanctified through his sacrifice for us. He's made an open door for us to come right straight into the very throne of his holiness because of his blood that was sacrificed. So that's what we're celebrating. So go ahead and take that little wafer and eat that. That's the body of Christ. And I just want to pray for you, Lord. We just proclaim healing across this congregation. Every single, if there's a sniffle, if it's cold, if it's the flu, if it's COVID, if it's stage four cancer, we command that thing to bow to the sacrifice that Jesus made at that whipping post. We command bodies in this place to be healed in your name. And by virtue of what you did, Jesus, thank you for that. And now we just release the power of the Holy Spirit across our congregation to be healed. Everyone, Lord, you went around doing good, healing everyone. And so, Lord, we'll claim that everyone in this place today because of that sacrifice of your body for us. And then that juice, go ahead and open that up if you haven't already. Take that little cup that represents the wine that Jesus served, which is his blood and uh, that he shed for us. And again, as we said before, it's so that our sins are not only forgiven, but forgotten. So take that cup, drink it. Lord, I thank you that you've demonstrated to us the love of the Father, that he is willing to sacrifice you, his only son, so that we can have a relationship. Our sins can be expunged, washed away, remitted, sent away forever. And Lord, we celebrate that. Lord, I thank you for everyone in this place. We pray for every heart that there'll be no condemnation. Like the song we sang, there's no place for shame. There's no place around here anymore. It's out because the blood has cleansed us. So we celebrate you and we honor you, Jesus. Praise God. Continue to worship.
wherever you were yesterday, wherever you were this past week, the Lord brought you here today, brought you into this room today to experience Him today. So wherever you've been and whatever you're doing, whatever you've done, you have the chance to return. And He's calling you home. Doesn't it feel good to be exactly where you're supposed to be right now? Doesn't it feel good to be exactly where the Lord wants you to be right now? Doesn't it feel good to know that no matter what's going on out there and what you've done, what your past looks like, that your future can be completely surrounded by the favor of the Lord and you can walk boldly into the rest of rest of your life, into the rest of your, into your workplace, into your family and say, I've returned to the King. We are returning again. We are returning. 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 place today or listening online on YouTube or Facebook and watching the meeting this morning, if you haven't yet made the decision in your heart that you want to go after God and go after Jesus, you should do that right now. So why, why, why not tomorrow or this evening or when I think about it a little bit more? Because the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. That means when we hear the good news, we should respond to it. Amen. We should respond to it. And it's just as simple as this, and you can just do this along with me. It's just a matter of, Lord, I know my need of you, and so I confess that I need you as my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sins, washing them away. I call you, Lord. Now lead me. Fill me with your Spirit. Direct, your, direct me by your Spirit for the rest of my life. I just give you that permission. I give you that place in my life that I had before. I was the boss. So I want you to be the boss, Lord of my life, in Jesus' name. And when you do that, you make that confession. You know, something happens. When we make a confession, we are affecting the spirit world that was in, that's invisible to us. When we say Jesus is Lord, God hears that. The Father hears that. Jesus hears that. All the angels hear that. And even the demons hear that. It's like, you know, ah, oh, nuts. Another one has confessed Jesus is Lord. And so it, and it's sealed. God calls us to be born again. There's a change that happens inside of our life forever where now we're able to perceive things of the Spirit. We're able to know the love of God. We're able to understand what it is to be a part of the body of Christ, to have brothers and sisters. Your whole life changes. So uh, if you prayed that prayer today, I congratulate you for making that step of making Jesus Lord of your life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big thank you, hand clap for what he's done. Lord, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for an awesome eternity. Amen. Well, I tell you what, we're not doing handshakes and hugs yet, but give your neighbor a big old Holy Ghost River Song high five or a, something, a little virtual hug. I don't know how you do it, but...
It'll work. All right. Good to see you all. Just a few quick announcements here before offering time. We do, I want to mention to you that we are still collecting food. Got my little note right here. We're still collecting food for the soup kitchen. And so out on the kiosk, you can find these little slips and it has on here uh, suggestions. There's some things they can use, some things they can't. So if you go by the, uh, the sheet, it'll sure help you a lot. But uh, canned fruit and canned pork and beans, and you got the Vienna sausages, granola bars, all kinds of things that's on the list. I'm getting hungry. If you have any questions, see Kathy Dennis. Kathy this morning is probably with Tim back here in the back. Good to see Tim on the board. Thank you very much, sir. And who's up there? We got Courtney on sound. Let's give these guys a thing. They're kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, when the team's up here, we got the lights on them. And, you know, your lights go down, but their lights stay up. And there we are, you know, the rock stars of the morning and the poor sound guy and the media person getting neglected. But uh, couldn't do it without them. So thanks, guys. So, Amen. Well, I tell you what, it's offering time. And uh, as Rob mentioned earlier, our friend Dave Digman is going to help us with offering today. So let's give Dave a big old welcome. We appreciate Dave and Sarah and the kids. All right, I'm excited. There was a, uh, a story of a church that hadn't quite met budget in a while, and um, much like River Song, they, they asked different people to introduce offering and this guy jumped up and said, don't worry, I've got you today, Pastor. Got up and he said, we're going to do offering a little bit different today. I want everybody to stand up. I want to reach your hands forward. No, I'm, this is part of the joke. But you can if you want. You reach your hands forward. Grab the wallet out of the pocket of the guy in front of you and give like you've never given before. <laughs> so I, that doesn't quite translate in the digital age somehow. You might have to take his phone or something. I don't know. Uh, but I kind of wrestle with this all week. You know, there's so many aspects to, to uh, giving. And I appreciate here at Riversong that we're excited about it and enthusiastic. And I, I noticed that, the, that here we seem to emphasize tithes. I've been in other congregations that really emphasize sacrificial giving. You know, uh, there's emphasis on cheerful giving. And um, is, it, is it too meet budgets? Is it to uh, employ staff? Is it to feed the poor? Is it to uh, engage in outreach? There's all these different aspects to it. And, uh, you know, I wrestled through this. What, what do I want to emphasize? And I wasn't getting an answer on it. So I started, all these things are good, but I felt like there was something that was missing. And I kind of wrestled with it all week. And I, I started studying. And usually that's clarifying to me to study, but in this case, it was not. It just got more and more complicated. Well, you know, they, they, they tithed on their crops, but they actually ate the tithe themselves. And then, you know, every third year, some of it was for the Levites. And then every sixth year, there was an extra one for the, ah, the this stuff doesn't really seem to translate very well. And it just, so I started thinking, well, what, what have I been taught? You know, and I thought, okay, I know what I've been taught as an adult. I've just wrestled through those things. Let's go back to my teenage years. Eh, nothing really there. I don't remember anything. Grade school, not so much. I'm, got, I'm getting way back now. So then I'm, I find myself reminiscing about, uh, uh, you know, it probably was kindergarten, maybe back then. I'm thinking about Sunday school. And there's three things that really stood out to me. One was this awesome new game called Duck, Duck, Goose, which uh, we promptly got restricted and then banned because of the reckless way we played it. Uh, two, this other poignant memory, it had to have been, I think it was an Easter Sunday, there was this girl in a white dress, she gave me this funny look, and then she threw up on the carpet in front of me, it was bright pink, and I remember thinking, that's unnatural, and she's going to die, and second one did not prove true, the first one was true, she later confessed she had eaten a second bowl of Barbie cereal that morning, 
I looked it up. It really did exist. I didn't remember it wrong. But then it hit me all of a sudden, like a ton of bricks. Uh, my Sunday school teacher, Lois Stockwell, um, with her little plastic bank, and she'd bring it out. And if you were, had really been on ball or your parents had been on ball and given you a, a coin to put in there, she would walk around and she would sing, I'm giving, I'm giving because I love Jesus. I don't know if anyone else remembers that. That's a real song too. I looked it up. It does exist. So I didn't remember that wrong either. And that's what hit me though. The, the, the encompassing, what are, what are all these things encompassed, encompassed in? Obedience, cheerfulness, sacrificial giving, uh, meeting the needs of the poor, meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters. All these things in giving, they all should be done out of love. Love for Jesus. How did he show his love for us? He gives. He gave his son. He gave his law. He gave provision. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's really what I, what I want to emphasize. And I think that River Song is really good at that. Um, I believe in your own spiritual journey. Uh, at different times, God will emphasize some of these different aspects when it comes to, comes to giving. There's a... Uh, there's an anecdote that's told of a uh, bishop, uh, an Amish bishop, and uh, he had a meeting one Sunday with his congregation, and he said, today I want to teach person to stand and share how their faith is progressing. So one by one, they stood and gave a testimony about how their faith was progressing. Uh, but there was one guy who sat in the corner, coming with his arms folded. Finally, he was the only one left who hadn't shared, and the, uh, the bishop called him out and said, uh, Brother Jacob, could you uh, tell us how your uh, faith is progressing? And he slowly stood to his feet and he said, well, I cannot say that I am progressing, but I can say that I am firmly established. <laughs> well, they had a little chuckle and uh, after the meeting concluded, uh, the bishop shut down and was heading back to his house in his buggy and he came upon Brother Jacob off the side of the road stuck in the mud. And he couldn't resist the uh, temptation to lean out and said, Brother Jacob, you are indeed firmly established. So uh, let's make sure our faith is progressing. All right? And one of the ways we do that is um, by giving. So let me pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to give. We pray that you would increase our faith and our love uh, through this act of obedience. Thank you for the people at River Song and their generous and cheerful spirit. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, sir. That was awesome. Amen. Reach your hand out. Take the billfold from your brother in front of you. That's great. Let's do that. Well, you see all the ways here we can give. Uh, Darren also has a basket at the back if you have cash or an envelope and you can drop it in there. But God bless you for being such wonderful givers. Uh, just one other announcement I didn't make earlier is we, we are going to be having our 5 p.m. prayer right here at River Song Church and praying for our nation, praying for our world, and uh, praying for a revival. It's been a really good prayer meeting. Some prayer meetings are a lot of work and that doesn't mean they're bad because prayer is work. Sometimes prayer is just uh, travailing and, and interceding, and it's a lot of work, but sometimes prayer can be very exciting, especially when you're praying in a group. We usually uh, set in a circle, and we can hear our brothers and sisters pray and to hear what God is bringing uh, out of them. Uh, you know, we pray that the Lord will give us a um, an input. We don't know what we should pray for as we should, but the Holy Spirit will help us. So when we pray, it's just really a good thing. So you're invited to come tonight and we just pray five to six. So you still have your evening after that. It's really super good. Speaking of praying, Sister Viv's our, uh, as our uh, super prayer example around here. She has something she wants to share with us. So better come over here in the light. Backing up, backing up. And how about you use that right there? There you go. You've been getting some good use out of this Bible. Did you guys see this thing? <laughs> good morning. Let's just pray in the spirit for a little bit. 
There are times in my um, morning time when the Lord just downloads things, and this morning was one of those times. <clears throat> and I usually don't use this Bible. I know it looks worn out, but <laughs> but anyway, in First Chronicles 10, verse 13, it says, "So Saul died for his trespass against the Lord." And there were three things here. First one, in sparing Amalek. Secondly, for his unfaithfulness in not keeping God's word. And also for consulting a medium with the spirit of the dead to inquire pleadingly of it. And there's a comma there, so let's read the next verse. And inquired not so of the Lord in earnest penitence. Therefore the Lord slew him and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Okay, so Amalek um, was a descendant of Esau. Do you remember that God said he loved Jacob and he hated Esau? Okay, Esau is a type of our flesh, our soul man that's not regenerate. And so also is Saul. Saul is an example also of the flesh. Okay, so... <laughs> So I want us to think about um, these, these ways that Saul was not obedient. Okay, so God wanted Amalek and, and all, the, all the sheep, all the oxen, everything taken out, and he did not, did he? And um, then later, do you remember when the women said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten of thousands? Okay, so remember, and pastors told us, us, us this over and over, it's not wise when we compare ourselves among ourselves. So really the women weren't even wise in bringing that up in the first place, but then that brought out a jealousy in Saul's heart. Now, did he let the Lord deal with that? No, he did not. He let it go to the point of murder. Jealousy unchecked will go to murder. I want us to stop a minute and just let God search our hearts to see if there's anyone we're jealous of. Okay, so one of my other favorite verses is in Psalm... Thirty-four, verse five. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces shall never blush for shame or be confused. So when we look up at him, he takes away all reproach. Um, Psalm eighty-five. Mercy and loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth. Okay, so we're on the earth. When we walk in truth, we're looking up to him, and the righteousness comes down, and there's that meeting together. It's like heaven and earth are agreeing. And... Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. The very land responds to how we respond to God. Righteousness shall go before him and make his footsteps a way in which to walk. God wants to guide us into all truth, for sure. So... Um, 
Who replaced Saul? Let's think about the differences between them. Saul had a few accomplishments. You know, he did take out those thousands. Um, he did, in the early days, he had a heart for his father's feelings. Remember, he was looking for donkeys. And then he realized, you know, my dad's going to wonder where I am. And there was a time when he was prophesying with the others. So he had a few accomplishments. But his end was in shame and fear of man. What are we getting rid of today? And fear of man, right? Okay. So, God wants us to have David on the throne of our hearts. The spirit of David. In other words, a man who is hungering and thirsting for his, um, his presence. And so let's allow that, okay? Let's, oh, <clears throat> let's allow the heart that David had, because David had really many sins, but he also had many accomplishments, many accomplishments. And when he was in sin, did he stay in it? No, he confessed it. He confessed it and forsook it. So... Does that mean we just have to walk around and be sinless? No, but we won't want to stay stuck in it. We don't want to be an Esau. We don't want to go walking after the flesh. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Amen. That's good words. So. All right. Yes. Amen. That's a good word. All right, children, you're being dismissed. Thank you, Mr. Mike, for taking care of our kids. So let's give Mr. Mike and the kiddos a, a thank you. Be blessed. Amen. Yeah, I want to be. I want to be more like David than like Saul. Saul was pretty awesome, but man, he messed up. So, Hallelujah. Thank you. Hey. So, um, wow. I told the uh, team in the huddle this morning that uh, I'm going to preach something that uh, uh, is new, but it's not new. It'll be a surprise, but not really. And what I meant by that uh, is that two weeks ago, um, of course, last week we had Aaron here that was really super amazing. He's sharing with us about uh, music and African-American church and and all that, it was just spectacular. The week before that, remember I preached about the lost axe head, and we read the verse there from uh, Second Kings where the prophets went down and, and began to cut down logs to build a, a bigger house, and uh, then we did the demonstration, and uh, you know, with a nice sharp axe, you can make a big old mess, but if the axe head flies off, you're just beating on that piece of wood with a stick, with a handle, and, um, you know, nothing much is accomplished with that. And so, you know, that was the message. And so, um, but I begin to get some feedback, and I always appreciate when people say, hey, Pastor, good message, really appreciate that. But in some conversations and some feedback I was getting, I think that I wasn't making myself clear, and people came away with an understanding of that message, which was something I wasn't saying really at all. And so what we're going to do today, I, I titled my message today, The Lost Axe Head, uh, Lost Axe Head um, 1.2. So we're going to go, go back in and uh, clarify a few things. And you'll know just what I'm talking about as we roll into this. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's going to be more fun the second time through than it was the first time. And uh, so, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. And we thank you that your word is this sharp two-edged sword that pierces all the way in and, and really reveals to us, like Viv was saying, what part of us is just living in the flesh and what part really truly is of you. So we pray that your word would be clear today. Help me to be clear in my speaking and then everyone in the house clear with understanding. And so uh, we can just glorify you and praise you so much for what's happening today in Jesus' name. Honey, can I have a pen? You thought I was calling Jesus, honey?
make myself a note so I don't forget. Eli Williams says he has this um, CRS thing. When you get old, CRS can't remember stuff. So I write it down. I want to make sure CRS doesn't mess up my that's one point I'd like to make today. But let's read the scripture again. Second Kings chapter 6, starting in the first verse, the disciples of the prophet said to Elisha, this place where we're staying is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan River. Each of us can get some logs and make a place for us to live there. Elisha said, go ahead. Uh, and then one of the disciples asked, won't you please come with us? Elisha said, I'll go. And so he went with them, and they came to Jordan River and began to cut down trees. And as one of them was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Oh no, master, it was borrowed. And the man of God asked, So where did it fall? And when he showed Elisha the place, Elisha cut off a piece of wood, threw it in the water at that place, and made the axe head float. And Elisha said, Pick it up. The disciple reached for it and picked it up. And so we have a happy ending uh, to that story. And then what we were talking about there, uh, and what I started off with was, if we compare uh, the signs and wonders, I think about uh, Gideon, where he was so afraid, and the Midianites were attacking, and they were being uh, stolen from, and oppressed, and put into slavery, and uh, Gideon was so afraid, and he was threshing in a hidden place, and just a terrible time for the nation of Israel. Been years and years since they heard the voice of God and the blessing and favor of God was upon them. And one of his things is, where are the miracles that we've heard about? And, um, of course, the Lord showed a miracle through Gideon. It was a great uh, defeat and a great revival that came to the nation. But sometimes I feel that way. Lord, where are the miracles? Where are the salvations? I hear about what's going on in Paraguay, what's going on in, in, um, in India, and in the, the hidden persecuted church in China. Lord, what's going on? What about Springfield? Well, you know, we want to see souls saved, uh, tens of thousands of souls coming to the kingdom. And to see the work of God, see miracles happening, that people with all the dread diseases and blindness and lameness, all those things happening, we read about them in the Bible, where are these miracles? And so when we compare, and Viv said don't compare yourself with others, but we're comparing ourselves with what God said we can be, should be, ought to be, will be, I'll say will be, from the Word of God. And so then the point I began to <clears throat> make with the demonstration was that once the axe head flies off and we're just beating at the situation with a stick, we're not going to cut anything. And we'll spend a lot of energy, we'll make a lot of noise, we'll sweat a lot, we'll get callus on our hands, but we're not getting any wood cut. And so, um, so here was the point. So what was missing? What was the difference between when they were getting the work done, all of a sudden they weren't? Well, the axe head flew off. And it went in the water, and you know about the miracle, threw a little branch out there, and the axe head began to swim, which I would like to see that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to push that VCR tape in. It might be on a DVD, or it might just be on a thumb drive. But somehow I want to see, Lord, can I see that? That sounds like a pretty cool scene. And we'll see what that looks like. <clears throat> but what we begin to teach on is that the axe head, just like Viv was just sharing, is walking in the Spirit. You'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The stick, the wooden handle, is the flesh. And uh, so Jesus said, the Spirit gives life. This is a verse we used uh, two weeks ago. The Spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. So here's what I really want you to get. I think that we missed the last time. The axe head went away. There's no more axe head. It's gone. He's beaten on it with a piece. Well, maybe, maybe once he hit it with wood. He didn't actually try to cut down a tree with the handle, but it wouldn't have worked. The axe head was gone. Jesus said the spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. So you have life. Life is really good, isn't it? And the flesh is nothing. So it's everything and it's nothing. Either the axe head's on or the axe head's off. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Remember we read about Paul, said that my preaching, my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with demonstration of the spirit and power. So it wasn't his brain, it wasn't his education, it wasn't even his experience, but it was the, the manifestation of the power of God. So there's a vast difference there. 
in how well you can think and talk and teach and, and you know, brain power is one thing, but the demonstration is totally different. He talked to the people at Athens, and, uh, and he talked to them, and nothing happened. So that was a great message, but yeah, but nothing happened. But then you later on see Paul, all he has to do is just take his handkerchief and wipe a little sweat off and say, go take that over that guy full of demons. And when they put that cloth on, just <sighs> the demons went out or they were healed of all kinds of diseases. See, that's demonstration. That's not, man can't do that. You know, when demons go out and lame people begin to walk and, and even people getting born again, you don't do that through the power of the flesh. That's a work of the Spirit of God. So Paul said, not this, but that. He said, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, buts are very important. Without buts, your legs fall off. I thought, I was thinking about, I was preparing this, and I was, I read that scripture, and I thought, buts are really important. If you don't have one, your legs fall off. All right, so notice Paul and Jesus didn't say preaching man's wisdom and demonstration. It didn't say the flesh and the spirit, but he said, but. It is one is not that, but this. So it's in and out, on or off. It's a uh, uh, one or a zero, an I or an O. That's the way it's very, what's, what do you call that, binary. You're either in or you're out. Here's where the misunderstanding was. What kept coming back to me was, yeah, Pastor, I really like that message. I need to get sharpened up. I need to get to the sharpening stone. I need to sharpen my life. I feel a little bit dull. I've been just felt a little like I've lost my edge. I thought, oh, my gosh, that's not what we were talking about. Remember, we said earlier in the service, Jesus didn't come to rehabilitate people. He came to uh, make dead people alive. So that's, that's, you see the difference? We're not talking about, you know, taking, you know, uh, Jeremy and making Jeremy a little bit better. We want Jeremy in the waters of baptism to be dead and gone, and then Jesus raised from the dead, and now we've got a whole new creature in Christ Jesus. See, there's this, you understand the difference there. It's, it's not uh, taking Jeremy and polishing him up a little bit and uh, saying, boy, doesn't he look a lot better? Uh, that wouldn't have worked for me. You could have done all kinds of things to rehabilitate me and make me better before I knew Jesus, and it still would have been a real ugly mess. But Jesus saved me when I received him as 